This week's Warfer Chips first, they've let me out second, it's a Collins Warfer Chips, I know you do all love that. I am in Billingshurst, now where on earth is that? You can Google it. We are at a company that in a short space of time has gone from basic technology to high-end technology and I'm going to learn some stuff as well. Can you believe it? This week's Swarfer Chips, let's find out more. The eagle-eyed amongst you will know where we are and what we do. How? That's how. So incremental engineering, industrial 3D printing. Yes, we can all read. They can design prototype production. Production on a 3D printer? Yes, indeed they can. But what do they actually do? First of all, they're a bureau. Yes, send in your design, they'll print it. Now come with me, we'll go through the, the whole process. But the guys here have got the skills, experience, knowledge, not just to take that design, print it for you, yeah, if that's what you want. They can get that design, add value and say, well, actually can't print it like that, or that design won't work, they'll add value. Or those crazy people out there, can I call them crazy, that's what, might have an idea, say, I want to print this, I want to make this. They'll get on the phone, speak to Jerry, and he'll go, leave it with me, we'll get it sorted. He'll design it, some great software, come up with a concept, print it, try it, and then re-manufacture re it if you want to. So three different routes there for him. How does it actually work though? Well, first and foremost, as I'm being told to get back here by our cameraman Ian, PA12, PA12, there you go, HP 3D material. It is as simple as that. Comes in powder form, so come on in, get, get your camera in here. That's no good there. PA12, what is it? It is a nylon material all over my hands now, and it is, it is the material for 3D printers, their go-to material. Why? Because it gives them flexibility, rigidity, so you could do super rigid parts, or you could do ones that really sort of really, really flexible, as I said there, really, but we'll come to that in a minute because I'm going to showcase some components. So what you do, out of there, into here, into the build unit. Now, you load that up with this powder, fill it up. As you see, build units all around, keep the, well, not spindles turning, but the printer's printing. We'll come to that in a minute. Where were they and where have they come from? Jerry worked elsewhere. They needed some prototypes. He had some FDM machines, 3D printers, real basic ones you'd have in your bedroom or your garage. You can Google it, we might get some cutaways from YouTube to showcase what they are. Now they have three state-of-the-art HP printers from Matsura. I'm going to point the camera over there, so that's one of the only ones in the UK that does 3D colour printing. Just get that correct, there you go, a little showcase of that. And then the one I'm standing next to and the one behind me do the single colour, but I want to know the technology, because if I'm thinking 3D printing, I'm thinking layers like my inkjet printer, or I'm thinking lasering, but that is not correct, so I'm going to get the experts over here, Jerry, he's been waiting in the wings. Give me a very quick lesson and talk and point at the technology that's going on in, in here, please. Nice and simple. Right, build units here, which is now full of nylon powder underneath. PA12. PA12. Gets pushed in, all the way to the back there. Printer's closed, we start the build. The build starts with these heating lamps in the top here, which raise the whole system up to just underneath melting point for the nylon. Then we layer in nylon, 80 micron thick layers. I'm going to ask you a quick question. What sort of temperature? The, the nylon's preheated to 168 degrees, or thereabouts. Maybe 167, maybe 169, but it's pretty accurately controlled by this thermal camera in the middle, and it's kept absolutely just below melting point. Then, underneath this part here, we've got three print heads, which HP very cleverly have leveraged from their 2D print business, which they've been long famous for, and they are super reliable and we've got two fusing lamps. So for each slice of the part that we're making, or the group of parts that we're making, you'll have an outline of the part which is solid. The ink comes over, the carriage comes over, and the inkjet will print a black part. It will then print some retardant around the edge known as detailing agent. That way, when these two lamps here add that tiny bit more energy, and the blackness then will absorb a little bit more heat, that will melt and it becomes part of the part. The detailing agent around the edge acts as a retardant so we don't get this over melt and spread of the melt pool into anywhere else. And that's it. You let it cool and get it out. There you go, nice and simple. Jerry, your job is done. You may now go and back and do some work. I've learned low today. So not 3D printing like an inkjet, not like a laser. Great, great technology from HP. No over melt, brilliant. So you're getting flexibility, rigidity, quality. Now, you've got your parts. Another build, another build unit here. As Jerry said, around 160, 170, well, 168, 169 degrees. It is hot, it needs to cool. It's gonna print for eight to 10 to 12 hours, depending application specific. 
it needs to cool. That could take two days. That's why they've got so many different build units here. You then pop it in here once it's cooled down. And something I've never really come across, a hoover. You've seen my plate, well, some of you might not have seen my place. Um, I'm, of course, joking. What they do, they hoover all this powder out, and you get your opponents here. Now, this is a great showcase of what these printers can do, because if we can just come around here to the screen, you can see the actual working envelope, all right, much, much bigger. But here it's a working envelope. It's an absolute jumble. But if we zoom in, I'm not going to zoom in because I don't want to touch this and I don't want to break it. But there are, as I understand, 200 components here. And some of them are laid out here as they've been printed. Now, they've been taken out of there. There are 10 different components here. So no sort of limit to your imagination in terms of what you want to print, how you want to print it. All right, there's a limit in terms of the envelope. You could do one big part. Their record is 5,000 parts in one of these envelopes. So you hoover it out. Now, the powder, we need, must come to that as well because we're all environmentally friendly these days. Some need to be more than others. At my age, not really that bothered. Obviously joking, but they want to recycle this because it isn't, it isn't cheap technology. So what happens is they take all this powder back into your PA12 box here, recycle about 80% of it, 20% new, new, new material, so they're recycling all the time. In fact, a great showcase of how much they recycle, they've used about, oh, they've got about 10 barrels of waste scrap since they started in 2018. And we can see that in the distance over there. We'll get a cutaway of that just to showcase that. So you've got your parts. They're all covered in, in the material. They need cleaning. So what do we do? We go to the Dimension Power Shot C. And what does the C stand for? Yep, you've guessed it, cleaning. So essentially, it's a big washing machine. All right, a little bit more technical than that. You pop your parts in there, get it tumbling. We'll get some cutaways of that. And then once it's finished, there you go. A nice finished part. Now, you might want it like that in terms of your surface finish, although you then go the next step. So that's your power shot C, cleaning, and power shot S, surface. So a slightly different medium. I didn't showcase the medium in there, but if we could see that over here, slightly different medium for, for blasting the actual component, you then get a different surface finish. So I think what we need to do is go and look at some of the components they make, because really, there is no limit to your imagination. Now, I won't do that in one walk, because those of you who don't know, our cameraman Ian, he's like the bionic man. He's waiting for two new, new knees. I wouldn't put him through that hell. So let's go and cut away to where the components are. In terms of parts, you know what? It seemed opportune to bring Jerry back, because he, he's clearly the expert. I want to take a step back, though. FDM, what does that stand for? Fused deposition modeling. Okay, so basic 3D printing, but you've moved on yeah, massively. Since melting then. a sausage of nylon and sticking it to stuff. Yeah, you don't do that. Use your F uh, PA12, super rigid, super flexible. So we need to showcase what they are, I think. Let's go through one part at a time, different reasons why you part printed them and why. Okay, so this one is a good demonstration of how we can include complexity. Um, we've got a really solid, really rigid part, but we've got a threaded connector printed in situ that's captive, can't ever escape. And there's not really any other way you could do that. We've got galleries running through it. We've got hex recesses in it directly for nuts to be embedded in it. And it's all about reducing the amount of post work that you need to do to the part by building the complexity in at print time. And a big part as well. A big, that is a big lump. We've done heavy... Talk about me or that. Uh, well, I wouldn't be so rude. Um, so this is probably one of the biggest in terms of size. In terms of weight, I think the heaviest part we've printed is about seven and a half, eight kilos in one, one lump, in one build on its own. It was a monster. A big part. But also going back, you've done 5,000 parts in one hit as well. That's our record, yeah. So 5,000 smaller parts, obviously. But yeah, we've been up to about 5,000. The average is somewhere between... 200 and three or 400, somewhere around that is more normal for us. Okay, so it's not just prototypes and one-offs and two-offs, it's a lot of parts if required. No, we, we work for production. That's generally where we are. So we will cut in before it's worth tooling up with a really expensive mould for a part. So the mould for that, you're looking at tens, if not more thousands of pounds. Whereas we can print one, we can print 10, we can print 20. By the time you get to 200, you're probably thinking maybe we should do the mould. But uh, come back to you guys. Anyway, look, I'm gonna, it comes out looking great. I'm going to move you on. I've got to yeah. mention Flexoraptor. I thought you may. So this is one of our little gimmicks, but it does show that you can have a mechanism printed as one single part. In different colours. Even yeah, I can spot that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is out of the colour printer. So this is as it came out the printer with no other process apart from a clean. Okay, next one then, because this is, ties in with the surface finish as well as, as, well as different colours. Yep, yeah, so this one's been vapour polished. So this was straight out of the colour printer and then cleaned and then vapour polished. There's been no paint work on this at all. This is as printed and you get a nice robust part 
that you can put straight on a machine. And I'm going to ask a really obvious question. What's it for? Uh, it holds a keypad onto a materials testing. It's supposed to say emergency stop. It does also hold the emergency stop button, funnily enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a hint there somewhere, I reckon. Absolutely. That's, what, that's, that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> now, this part, this is a great example so of... This is lightweighting. So you can take a part and you can add a lattice to it and then print it and there, therefore you use less material. It's cheaper. To add this level of complexity, it comes out cheaper. But we're using less material to do the same job. And still getting the strength I require, I'm still assuming. Still getting the strength. We obviously lose, it's no longer a solid bit of material, but we can engineer the lattice to give you the strength where you need it and not where you don't. Nice and simple. Now, yeah. these parts, I think we should go from there to there to there to there to there. Okay, so this is a straightforward die, um, which has been anthracite dyed to give you a beautiful sort of gunmetal colour. But this is all, if you follow it around, and you oh, can, yeah, you yeah, can, yeah, you can pause the screen and, yeah. and do it yourself, but that's all one part, essentially. It is all one part, yeah. So it's a trilobe model that you can follow the ribs that go all the way around and back through and back over again. And it is, yeah, it's a lovely little part. And it ends up being quite springy as well. Okay, and then, but that is clearly different to that. So the same model, but this one was dyed black and then vapor polished. So we get a finish on the vapor polishing that is pretty close to an injection molded finish. Oh, it's a proper consumer like that? I wouldn't want to try. No. Okay, now again, state the and obvious, you've done something slightly different here. From the colour machine, this one. So we've got a photo of a mosaic that we overlaid, and then obviously our logo, over the top of it, which we've wrapped around the whole part and all the way through the part. So I don't know if you can see inside, but the, the mosaic is repeating down the inside of each of the arms as well. I'm thinking again, and I alluded to earlier, the only limit is your imagination. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've got a customer who asked us if we could print a chain, and the answer was, well, yes, chains are easy. Vapor polishing a chain, so you get a beautifully finished chain with tiny little daisies and a mosaic, same mosaic pattern again, and then a general colour one and a cam camouflage one. Yeah, you could do what you like um, to get a nice finished consumer part. And there's no links here, that's all printed in one go? That's all printed in one go, yeah. I mean, you could make it as long as you like by just nesting it into the volume and just keep going and going and going. That's where we leave it to the experts to work all that sort of thing out, though. I, yeah, it takes a while, that. <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't. But go on, and ne next one in. Last, uh, so another piece from the colour. So we can put text into it, we can put assembly guides into it. So put the nut in the pink hex, put the pink bolt in, put the rod through the green hole. Same again on this part, we've got identifiers to help users and things like that. Another one out of the production printer, if we lightweight the material enough, we can get it down to pretty thin, flexible parts. So this is 0.7 of a millimetre thick, and I think it's just over two metres long. Um, so it was printed nicely coiled up in the printer, and then we can unravel it afterwards to give a pretty unmanageable monster of a part. There you go. I'm going to stop you there. That is a great, great insight into some of the parts you can do. It is a 10-minute show. Hopefully we haven't gone over because our editors go absolutely bonkers at us. But this week's Swarf Chips, it's a great story. 2018 to where we are now, 2022, from FDM printers. Yep, two of them. Two, oh, three yes. state-of-the-art HP printers from Matsura. No limit. And it's not just about small, small one-off prototypes. It's about batch runs. Absolutely, yeah. That's where we are. It's been quite a journey. It's a fantastic journey. There you go, a little bit about 3D printed technology. This week's Swarf and Chips.